Uh, a teacher um, once asked some of their stu- her students to describe salt, to describe salt. And one of the little kids in the class said this, like finally raised their head because nobody else would, and said, salt, salt is that thing that if you don't sprinkle it on fries, they're disgusting. <laughs> that's what he said. And that's a great description of what salt is, right? And we think about that. That many foods are like that. They're incomplete without one of the key ingredients. Think about uh, pizza without cheese on it, right? Call it what you want, but it ain't pizza, right? Um, and, uh, And there's many other foods like that. And as we look at in this series, as we've been looking at this idea of love, what we need to understand is this. To live as a Jesus follower and as a Christian If we don't have love, then we can call it whatever we want. Like we can we can say a whole lot of things, but but we can't really call ourselves a Christian. Because love is a key ingredient to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So that's why we've been talking in the series, what's love got to do with it? It really has everything to do with it. And Jesus said this over and over throughout the Gospels, and Jesus looked at his disciples, and, and he just brought it down to the very bottom shelves. He says, by this, the world's going to know that you follow me if you love one another. In Jesus' mind, love was an essential ingredient in what it looks like. And so... As from that time on, when Jesus said these things, the, the Christians and Jesus followers have been trying to navigate what it looks like to live that out. What does actually loving people look like? What does love really look like? And so we come to a, 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 a chapter in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul wrote, and it's 1 Corinthians 13. You've probably heard it before, even if you've never been in church before or been in church irregularly, you know, you, you've probably heard this of this chapter. It's called the love chapter, and it's read at most weddings. It hangs on a lot of people's walls. It's quoted by a lot of people who not eat, people who don't even like uh, claim to follow Jesus. And yet, this 1 Corinthians 13, if you read it in the context of the whole book, like you have been, if you've been in one of our discipleship groups, we've been actually reading through 1 Corinthians this week, and what's been uh, standing out to me as I've read through the whole of the book of 1 Corinthians is that 1 Corinthians 13 wasn't written for a wedding ceremony. It was actually written um, because the church was having some issues loving one another. There was a whole lot of conflict taking place amongst the Jesus followers in Corinth, and and they just weren't loving well. They were getting in all sorts of disagreements, and all sorts of uh, there was all sorts of fighting about different viewpoints and and. and unharmony with one another and and things that were causing fractures within the church. And so Paul writes about what love is, not necessarily just for those people who are married or for how we should treat our family, but also how we should treat one another within the church and by extension, how we should treat the world that we live in, the places where we work, the people who are friends with that love is a really big deal to God. In the middle of this disagreement about um, all these sorts of theological things, here's what, here's what Paul says, and we've read this each week of the series, and we'll do it again just because I think repetition helps us uh, kind of get this down. He says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noising gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mystery and knowledge. And if I have all faith, so to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, uh, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And then here's what he says love is. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. 
The phrase we're going to focus on today, we're going to, each week of the series, we've been kind of narrowing it down and spending a week just kind of focusing on one of the elements of what this, uh, what Paul says love is by very definition. And so this week, we're going to focus in on this uh, passage. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. I appreciate how Eugene Peterson paraphrases this in the message. He says, love doesn't strut or it doesn't have a swelled head. I like that. Another version says, love is not proud. In other words, if we take that and we flip it around, then what is love? What, does, what defines love? Love is, is humble. Love is humble. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote this. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves than pride. In fact, uh, if you're like most people, when I said, that, hey, we're going to talk about how love is not proud, right? Love is humble, it's not proud today. A lot of us um, maybe think of somebody that we wish was here to hear that. Right? We're like, oh man, this would have been the Sunday for them to be here, right? Because we all think about the person at work or something that has this ego about them that always is talking about themselves or boasting about how great they are. We think of the family member that every single conversation turns at some point in the conversation so that they can tell a story about how great they are. You, think, you know that person, right? We think about the person. Who, who can't stop, uh, you know, uh, and just walks around with this, this egotistical strut that the, the, they just believe themselves to be the greatest. And we're like, man, I wish that person was here today. But upon further investigation of our own hearts and of our own souls, I hope that we can identify in our own hearts the areas in which we all struggle with pride at some level. And so to self-diagnose a little bit, let me ask ourselves some questions. Ask yourselves these questions. Have I ever exaggerated something I've done to impress somebody? Have I ever made fun of somebody so that I would look better? Have I ever done something either ridiculous or outrageous just to get people's attention? Have I used flattery to get what I want from somebody? Have I belittled somebody's feelings and looked down upon them? Have I refused to listen to someone else's perspective and insisted that my way was best? And if those answers any of, to any of those are yes, then we have to diagnose that we have some pride within us. Pride is one of those things, one of those sins, one of those areas that just kind of would love to slip in unnoticed. That we would think of ourselves more highly than we ought. It's a sin that worms in, in its way into our lives, and when it does, it kills our love. And so we have to be purposeful about weeding it out because we really believe that God's word says, and what Paul is saying here is that the definition of love, one of the definitions of love that he gets is love is humble. So where do we go for the best example of what's that look like in practical sense? What's that look like in an everyday, day-to-day -day living? How do we live out love as humble? Who should we look to? Of course we should look to Jesus, right? Who did life perfectly, who lived love perfectly because he is love. And so we look back into the pages like we've been doing with this whole series as we've looked at what love is and then we've shown it in Jesus' life and then we talk about how it could look in our life as we model our lives after Jesus. So today we're going to look at a passage in which Jesus shows off humble love. We got to know that this is coming towards the end of Jesus' life, towards the end of his ministry. He knows that very soon, in fact, the very next day, he was going to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And so as he's coming to this moment, we also know that by context, if we look at 
the context of this passage that the disciples, the 12 guys that have been following Jesus around for, for three years, learning under Jesus, apprenticing under Jesus, that they had come into this night arguing about who was the greatest, right? The exact opposite of love is humble, exact opposite of humility is what they were displaying. They were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus, more than just teaching them another lesson, he demonstrates extraordinary humility. This is found in the Last Supper, and maybe you've heard of this story before as well. It's been part of many paintings, and it's been part of many different um, uh, lessons, even not necessarily Christian lessons It's called the Last Supper, where Jesus had come with his disciples the night before he was going to die. And they were celebrating a Jewish feast called Passover, a very Jewish tradition, but Jesus was going to change it forever. In fact, what we just celebrated in communion was the changing of which Jesus did in this. But before Jesus got to that moment where he shared with them what he did, uh, what was going to do for them on the cross, um, he showed them what humble love looks like. Let's pick up our text in John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I love that that John just kind of encapsulates this moment here, and he says, you know, not only was this the Passover, this was the reason they were getting together. This was the most important meal that these guys would ever have together, that this was the beginning of the end. But John reminds us that Jesus loved his disciples to the end. That Jesus' heart moved in love towards them and not just telling them, hey, I love you guys, but that he actually showed it. He actually lived it out in a real, tangible way. That's the problem that we have often with the way that we use the word love in our culture is that most of the time we settle for love being just what we say. That we use that word, I love you, or I love you guys, or, and we think that that's enough. And what Jesus says when it says that he loved them to the very end, it means that he modeled love, that he lived love to the very end. And he's going to show it right now in this way. Verse 2. During the supper, when the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. John points out a few important details in the context of this story. First of all, these were the final few moments Jesus had with his disciples. He knew that. Jesus knew that, that, um, that tomorrow was going to be the day that he died on the cross. He knew that. He also knew that the one that was going to deliver him into the hands of the Romans was sitting in the room with him. It says he knew that Judas, the man that was going to betray him, was sitting there in the room. And he chose to love anyway. And he knew that he was going back to the Father. These details makes Jesus' actions even more significant. Right? Because... Because Jesus loved even the guy that he knew was going to sell him out. Even the guy that, that was about to betray him, Jesus, he didn't, he didn't just wash the feet of everybody else and say, Judas, you're a bum. Get out of here, right? I know what you're going to do. He washed even the guy that was about to betray him. In this first century Jewish culture, the way Jesus chose to show love here was a complete reversal of status. 
foot washing in the, cult- in the, cult- uh, in the context of the culture um, due to the climate of that area, right, and the time in which Jesus lived, people walked around um, in either uh, one of two uh, foot gear, uh, sandals or no foot gear, like barefoot, right? And there was not like paved roads or nice lawns like we have. It was dirty. It was dusty. It was, it was, um, it was a mess. And so people's feet got dirty. And so in that context, it was not uncommon that when you entered into a room in order to keep the house clean, that you would wash your feet. And in most settings, in most houses on a day-to-day basis, when when you would just come home, there'd be a basin there with a pitcher, and, and you would be responsible for washing your own feet. However, if there was a large gathering of people, um, it was almost, it was customary and ordinary to have a slave or a servant there who would wash all the guests' feet as they would come in. That was just part of their culture. It was, um, it was, uh, no, it was, um, Everybody knew it, right? And, and Mark's gospel records that th- this Passover dinner would take place in a uh, borrowed room, right? The disciples were, Jesus told the disciples to go find a room to, to have this last supper in. Jesus and his disciples didn't own a home, so they had to find a place. So this would have been a room um, that they were borrowing for the night, and uh, the the absence of someone there to wash the feet would have been noticed. It was a massive oversight. Let's just put it that way. And everybody in the room knew it, right? And the disciples that were charged with going to get the room should have lined up the servant that was gonna wash the feet. So they all get in the room, and this is where I think we need to just kind of step out of our culture and try to step into the room where they were at. All these disciples, these 12 guys, as Jesus has had these intense conversations with them over the last week, as Jesus is preparing himself to die, the disciples didn't understand that, but Jesus knew it. They walk into this room, and they had already been arguing all week long about who was going to be the greatest. And so they come in this room, and they look around, and there's no servant to wash feet. There's a basin there with water. There's a pitcher. There's a towel but no servant, no slave to wash feet. There had to have been nudging of the two guys that were sent to find the room of like, guys, come on. You totally overlooked this, right? And because of this, um, they're like, they were all kind of silent about the foot washing because they might have been afraid that it, to ask Jesus about it because if somebody would have brought it up, maybe Jesus would have said, well, yeah, I mean, you take care of it. Which would have put them at the lowest spot on the totem pole, which all of them were trying to avoid because all of them wanted to be the greatest. And so there's this awkward tension in the room of who's going to do this, and I think Jesus... Just lets it sit there for a minute. While everybody else is uncomfortable, everybody's sitting around this table with dirty feet, stinking the place up, Jesus just lets it sit, wondering if any of the disciples were going to do the right thing. And then Jesus gets up. And we're told that... um, that he goes over to the basin, that he takes off his outer garments and puts on a towel, picks up the basin and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. It's interesting, right, that Jesus took off his outer garments and put on the towel, right? He didn't have to do that. Like, you can wash your feet with the outer garments on. Why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus take off the outer garments so that, that in order to wash the disciples' feet? I think the point that Jesus was driving home is that Jesus took off his outer garments because he not only wanted to exemplify the role of a servant and a slave, but he wanted to look the part as well. He wanted to put himself for in front of the disciples by this de- in a deliberate role, 
One Bible call, scholar said it this way, by each, uh, by each of these deliberate actions, Jesus adopted the look and the role of a slave. Jesus didn't have to strip down to and put on a towel, but he was driving home the message. Through this simple act, the most high became the most low. The God of the universe who stepped down into his creation, the most high God who created everything that we look became the most low in the room at that moment. The disciples would have been shocked um, that because um, no one would have argued that Jesus was the most important person in the room. He was their master. He was their rabbi. He was their Lord. He was their savior. He was going to be their savior, right? Nobody argued. That, like everybody else in the room was arguing about who's going to be greatest next to Jesus. Like Jesus, there was no doubt that he was going to be the greatest. And he was the greatest, most significant person in the room. And so the disciples would have been shocked and utterly embarrassed because Jesus, the most high, took on the position that they could have and should have. They missed it. In puffing themselves up with pride, they missed the moment. And Jesus didn't. The foot washing was Jesus' way to show all of humanity who God was like and what God does and what love looks like. That love is humble. So, Jesus is just doing that. And I, I, I love, I would love, like, I would love to be a fly on the wall in this room, right? To just kind of see the look. Could, could the disciples even look at Jesus while he's washing their feet? While he's doing this? No, man, the embarrassment, the shame of that, just like, oh, guys, we blew it again, right? Well, then it comes to Peter. And Peter um, has no problem any time of talking, right? He, he, he loves to share exactly what's going on in his head. And so it comes, uh, Jesus comes to Simon Peter, who says, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now. But afterwards, you will understand. And when he says afterwards, you'll understand, he's not talking about after the Jesus washed his feet. He's talking about the cross. Afterwards, you'll understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that's why he said not all of you were clean. So there's a lot going on here. There's this little drama taking place with Peter in this moment, as is usual. And uh, it's no surprise that Peter misunderstands what Jesus is doing. And when I read this, I, I, it makes me chuckle, right? Because I think that Jesus has this interaction with Peter often where Peter kind of misunderstands and he overstates something, right? He overstates his position and then Jesus has to kind of talk him back off a ledge. And so essentially he comes and everybody else was thinking of it. Peter just said it because that's who he is and the, he's that guy. He, he just says it. And so he's like, Lord, no way. You ain't washing my feet, right? Here, in fact, Give me the towel, give me the basin, I'll do it. This is just too much for me to handle. And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, unless I wash you, you're not going to have any part of me. And he, of course, he's referring to something far larger. He's referring to the cross and salvation. He's referring to um, Jesus washing him uh, clean, his sins to be forgiven. But Peter doesn't understand that. And so he says, you're not going to wash my feet. And, and he's like, you know what? I need to wash you. You're not going to have any part of me. And then he's like, fine, then give me a bath, right? And Jesus is just like, no, Peter. Like, I don't need to give you a bath. I just need to wash your feet, 
right? And again, Peter just kind of overstates this thing, and he jumps in with two feet. So many times we can relate to Peter, can't we? Peter, um, he, he just, um, he overstates his, um, his disgust at Jesus showing love. He overstates his disgust with Jesus showing love this way. Have you ever overstated Disgust at somebody showing love. Maybe it's we look around and we see the people who are living out this principle of love, loving the least of these. Like, I can't believe. I mean, if they would just, and if this would happen. Then... Sometimes... We not, we not only fail to show love, sometimes, sadly, we even look at kind of with disgust upon those who are showing love. And that's what Peter does here. And he overstates it and Jesus corrects him, as was the case in most of Jesus, Jesus and Peter's relationship. And when he had washed their feet, he put on the outer garments and he resumed his place and he said to them, here's the lesson. Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have, have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, uh, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus gives them an example to copy. This seems fairly simple. This seems like a lesson that should be fairly straightforward for us to take to heart. But Jesus says this interesting phraseology. He says, a servant is not greater than his master. And they would have all said, oh, yeah, like we know what that means, right? That Jesus is greater. He's the master. He's the, and, and what Jesus is telling these guys is, guys, you know this. You're not greater than me. You're not. And you know that. And yet, look what how I showed you love. That's how I want you to show love to one another. That's how I want you to live this out, a position, to take the position of a servant, a slave. And as Jesus followers, inviting us to do the same. See, I don't think this is as much about physically washing feet as it is about our attitude. It is about our attitude when we are invited to or see opportunities to love in humble, menial ways. To love by serving. To lead by serving. Jesus gives us an attitude to emulate. When he washed his disciples' feet, he declared that's for us an example to follow. And Jesus goes about being a servant with all humility. See, the problem with most modern-day foot-washing ceremonies, which, be, which is a thing in um, certain um, pockets of Christianity, and it's a high value, and I'm not trying to throw rocks at them. Um, in fact, I think foot wa like washing feet is, is a a beautiful way of showing love. Here's the problem with it, is that when we wash people's feet, we're emulating Jesus. When Jesus washed his disciples' feet, he was emulating a slave. And so for us, we're like, oh, I'm gonna emulate Jesus because, and in some kind of 
backward, twisted way even. We can even take pride and we can take a little bit of of uh, self-worth and and pride in us emulating Jesus by washing people's feet. Look at us. We're going to wash feet. This is is great. Look at us. We're going to be like Jesus. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus, Jesus took the form of a servant and a slave. So the question is, what does that look like for us? to humble ourselves, to live how Jesus lived. Again, I'm not throwing rocks at washing feet. I think it's a great way to show love to people. But what I'm asking even deeper is what is our heart and our attitude and our motivation behind that? Is it purely to love Is it because it's the lowest thing we can do? See, the real test is when we do what we need to do for whoever it is in need to do it without grumbling or complaining or boasting or arrogance or pride. It means sticking around for the messy, the unglorifying, unglorifying, boring stuff. It's doing that which nobody else will really see or recognize just to show love. We need to learn to do this again and again and again. To find joy in humility. To find joy in service. To not avoid the menial tasks, the unnoticed things. to just show up in love. I love what Jesus, he says this, I have given you an example, now do what I have done. I have given you an example, now do what I have done. Jesus isn't saying here, now go wash everybody's feet. He's saying, now go love people by putting people above yourself. Go love people by slotting yourself in underneath others. What does it look like to take the role of a servant or slave with those whom you say you love? Love is a choice, and it's to not impress, but it's a choice to be humble and ready to serve. Because what Paul says is this, by very definition, what, what is love? Love is humble. And so to love is to be humble. I love how one uh, preacher I read, I put it this way. Selfless humility is the soul of love. Put it, and to put it another way, only humble people love. And your capacity to love is directly related to the capacity to humble yourself. It's a simple biblical truth and principle. Only humble people love. The humbler you are, the less interested you are in yourself and the greater capacity to invest yourself in somebody else. They are related to one another proportionately. The lower you go in self-concern, the higher you go in concern for others. Um, I think about how um, this looks in a real practical way, right? How do we live in such a way that we concern, we have high concern for those around us? I'm going to skip forward one, but because I, I love the way Tim Keller puts this. The essence of gospel humility is not thinking of myself, uh, not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself It is thinking of myself less. In other words, it's this, right? Humble people don't think higher of themselves than they ought to or lower themselves than they ought to. They just don't think about themselves. And I think about that often because sometimes even in our uh, attempts to be humble, we stumble into false humility. 
We're, we think to ourselves, well, I'm just no good, and I'm just low, and I'm just the scum of the earth, so I don't know. That's not humility. That's false humility, and that's not what God's after. He's after just us not thinking of ourselves at all. And here's the beauty, and I'll back up to the quote I missed. There's nothing more relaxing than humility. Think about that. That's, that, one stumped, that one's tripped me up all week. I've been thinking about that quote all week. There's nothing more relaxing than humility. Can you imagine in your life just living without the need to pull yourself up, to scratch and claw for everything that you everything you get or the, the worth that you find is found in your accomplishments so you scratch and claw to try to find, can you imagine how your life would be relaxed if, if the people's opinion, like people's opinion of, of you paled in comparison to what God thinks about you and who God says you are? When we live humbly, when we love humbly, we resemble Jesus because love is humble. Let me finish just with a couple questions that I want you to ponder as we leave today. Where in your life are you most prone to pride? Maybe it's in your job, maybe it's in your family, maybe it's in your, with your friends, maybe it's with your school, maybe it's with um, what you're good at, your talents you have. Where are you most prone to pride? Where are you most prone to make everything about you and everything kind of center on you? Then ask yourself this question this week. What does washing feet look like in my life right now? And when I say washing feet, I don't mean physically washing feet necessarily. But in your life right now, what does it look like to follow Jesus' example of selflessly serving? serving, To putting yourself below and elevating others. And thirdly, how will you practice humble love this week practically? In other words, how are, we gonna, how are you going to change what's going to look differently as you seek to love the way Jesus loved this week? So just wrestle with that. Where, where are you most prone to pride? What does it look like to wash feet in, in, my, in my context and in my setting? And how are you going to practice that in a real practical way this week and put it into practice? Because if we look at the very last verse that Jesus says, verse 17, he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You see, what Jesus wasn't after with his disciples was them to have a head knowledge that they should go serve. He wanted them to practice that. He wanted them to live it out. He says, blessed, he didn't say, blessed are you if you hear a sermon about it and think about it for a little bit. Blessed are you if you, you know, let it kind of, stick with you all afternoon and you think about those questions, but then you kind of forget about it the rest of the week. He says, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are we if we put into practice what Jesus says love is. Because not only is love patient, we learned that week one. Love is kind, we learned last weekend. And love is humble. So let that be the definition by which we work off when we say, I love you. Do we just say it or are we practicing those things?